My name is Cheryl Purgett, and I am here to talk about Yosemite. I moved to California 30 years ago um, in the spring and made my first trip to Yosemite the fall of the following year, 29 years ago, about this time. We did like a 12 or 13 hour hike that started up by sunrise and came down and we followed Tenaya Creek down through the valley and out Mirror Lake and out through um, Yosemite and out through uh, Curry Village and I fell in love with the park. And I have gone back every year at least once and sometimes as many as six times to hike it and to learn more about the park because I have found that when you know the history of something and how it came to be, you appreciate it more. So I'm here to talk about Yosemite then and now. Yes, please, let me know if you cannot hear me. So, <laughs> louder? Can you adjust this louder? Mark's going to turn it up. Okay, is that better? Yes. Okay, and Mark's going to turn it up a little bit for you too. Yosemite started in 1851. Um, there was a man named, uh, James, uh, named James Savage who had a trading post down in Mariposa and he claimed that the Indians had come and raided his trading post and he got permission from the governor to form a battalion to go find the Indians and bring them out to the reservation. So he formed his battalion and they went in and they went in about Wawona and they headed out they knew not for what. When they got to the rim of the valley, this is what they saw. They were the first white men to ever see the valley, and they were awestruck. And they had a naming party that night. And some people suggested Paradise Valley, some suggested Heavenly Valley. But uh, uh, Lafayette, Lafayette Bunnell suggested Usumate, which is a Native American for grizzly bear. And the men liked it, and so that's what it, that, they adopted that. And it has gotten slurred a little bit over the years, so it is Yosemite that we know it today. <clears throat> This man came along in 1855. This man is James Hutchings. James Hutchings is as much an entrepreneur as anything. He had a magazine called California Magazine, and he wanted to get some tourists, and he thought he was going to advertise Yosemite. So he took an artist, and they went into Yosemite, and he saw dollar signs, and he homesteaded illegally 125, 120 acres across the middle of the valley. Uh, it was illegal, so it got taken away from him, but he did get tourism started. And for the next 10 years, they had about 85 tourists a year, which doesn't sound like much. If I slow down, it's going to go to two hours. <laughs> if you can't hear me or don't understand, please, please stop me, and I will be happy to repeat it. So um, 85 tourists a year, which doesn't sound like much when you think of the 4.5 to 5 million tourists a year that come to Yosemite. But this is the park, and this is the valley. That is where those 85 tourists a year were coming. There are three dates to remember for Yosemite. 1864 was the first date. That is the date that President Lincoln signed a bill setting aside the Yosemite Valley and a mile around it and the Mariposa Grove, which is down here, to be held in its natural state for the enjoyment of everybody forever. And he gave it to the state of California to manage. It was a state park. In 1890, they made a national park. It was the third national park. And the park was basically a big square like this. Um, in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt, after visiting with John Muir, agreed to combine the whole thing, take the state park back, and make it into one national park. And in doing so, he had to give up some things around the edges. And some interesting things that are gone are the minarets, Devil's Post Pile, and Ansel Adams Wilderness, which is over here. They were more, in, more of interest to private uh, industry. <clears throat> so this man is Galen Clark. Galen Clark showed up in 1857. At that time, he had been given a diagnosis of consumption and given six months to live, and he thought, I might as well go live in the mountains. If it helps me live longer, great. If it doesn't, it's a beautiful place to die. So he went up and he built a cabin at Wawona. He was 42 years old at the time, 42 or 44. And he built a cabin at Wawona. Now, 
James Hutching, or Galen Clark is the first white man to see the giant sequoias that are up here in Mariposa Grove. And he loved them so much that he built a cabin up there. When you come in from Fresno, up from the south on Highway 41, and come in the park, you're going to see as you go, as you just pass the, the entrance gate, you're going to see a big parking lot on your right. And if you go in there and go up the stairs, this is what you'll see. How, who's been to the Mariposa Grove? Okay, have you been there since 2019? Okay, some of you have. It's been changed. For those of you who were there before 2019, it's very different. They used to have um, paved, uh, paved paths that they had, trams that ran on, they were, uh, donate, they were narrated by a naturalist, and they could drive you all the way through the park and come back to the, uh, the, the Welcome Center at the start of the park. But in 2015, by 2015, they had discovered that the, the paths were interfer interfering with water flow. They had old trees. They didn't have very many young or, in or intermediate trees. So they closed the park in 2015, and with the help of the Conservancy, Yosemite Conservancy, they tore out all of the paths. They stopped the trams. There are no trams through the park. And they moved the Welcome Center two miles north. So if you come up to this, up now, this is what you'll see. Oops. Oops, I gotta get back. <laughs> this is what you'll see. Um, this is a, a flush bathroom. These, there's a gift shop in here, and over here is information about the park. And if you, go around, if you go around the edge over here, this is what you'll see. There's a bus that takes you up to the start of the park, two miles up to the start of the park. You cannot drive to the park, you cannot drive through the park. If you have a handicap sticker, you can drive up to the start of, park, start of the park, and you can drive one mile further up to the grizzly giant. Now, they still have all the trees. They still have the, the drive-through tree, which is now a walk-through tree. As you'll see, there's no paved path going through there. But people go walk through it and t take their picture all the time. This is actually the second one. The first one actually was higher up in the, in the, uh, in the grove, and it blew down in, in the 60s in a snowstorm. Um, the grizzly giant is still here, and unlike popular belief, it is not the biggest or the oldest uh, giant sequoia in the, in the world. That is General Sherman over in Sequoia, over in Sequoia Park. But the grizzly giant is big. It is over 200 feet tall, and it is over 3,000 years old. And it has a branch on it that is over six feet in diameter, one branch. So Galen Clark so loved his grove that he built a cabin in the upper grove. And it used to be open into the 90s. It was open. And I went in there. That's where I first joined what was then the Yosemite Fund. And they closed it at the end of the 90s during the early 2000s. It used to be uh, staffed with volunteer docents in there. But now you can go up. You can sit on the por porch and eat your lunch or whatever. And it's, but it's hard to appreciate how big these trees are until you see something like this, where you've got a big tree next to it, um, or this. There are five of us standing here, and as you can see, we take up maybe a quarter or a third of this tree. This tree is at least 40 or 50 feet diameter at the base. Or this. This is the fallen monarch. When, when you ride the bus up to where the park starts and you start up the boardwalk, you're going to go past the fallen monarch. And it looks much the same today as it did 100 years ago when it fell, and it is huge. So now that we've gone through the grove, there are eight miles of trails through the grove. You can hike and uh, learn more about the grove. They have informational stuff throughout the grove. Um, and if, if you're done with the grove, you can come down. And as you go further west, the next thing you're going to see is Wawona Hotel. This is Wawona Hotel. Galen Clark, this was originally Galen Clark's cabin. He had a little cabin here. Um, and as tourism started, he couldn't stand it. He was such a kind-hearted man. He couldn't stand it if people had to go by and not have lunch or a place to stay. So he started building on rooms to his house and turned it into a small house hotel. However, he wasn't an astute businessman. And in 1874, he had to sell his hotel to the Washburn brothers. And they built this hotel. This is one of two, uh, two buildings in the park that are still in active use from 1879. It has scaffolding in front of it because it's undergoing renovation. Because uh, it's undergoing renovation, and there are more buildings over here. It's been added onto over the years, so you can go up there. You can get a reservation. You can stay, 
for about $150 to $200 a night. Um, the thing is, the, yes? I just have, I, I belong to the association. They close, they'll close it permanently with no date of reopening until in December. And so the, the whole hotel or just this? The whole, 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 whole I, I was going to say, I'd heard something on the news yeah, that as they were. Okay. Yeah, as they were doing this renovation, they found more problems. They weren't sure what was going to happen, but it sounds like they've closed it now, so you cannot stay there. Right. They're going to investigate, but they, uh, as, as of now, they have no... Uh, no, okay. She's saying that the Wabona Hotel, they found problems in it that may not be correctable. They have closed the entire hotel and with no future date of opening, unfortunately. It's a nice hotel. Most of the rooms are not air-conditioned. Most of them don't have a private shower. You have to go to a group shower. Um, but it's kind of an old-fashioned hotel. And over here, there was a big dining area, which is a wonderful place to eat. Over here, this is Best's studio. And Best was a, an artist back in the 60s. And you can go in and see his paintings that are in there. And you can go down over here. There's a path that goes down to the Pioneer History Center, which you can access from this hotel or you can come down to the street and go down to the corner and you'll find a gas station at the corner. That gas station is one of two gas stations in the park. I would encourage you if you're coming into the park to fill up well outside the park because gas in the park is going to cost you a dollar to a dollar and a half more than it does here in Placerville. This one is 22 miles up from the valley. Um, but if you turn at that, there's a gift store and grocery store in the parking lot for the history center and you access the History Center by going through a covered bridge. Now, down in the valley, in the in 1950s and 60s, when they were tearing down the old village, which was on the south side, and rebuilding it on the north side, they got to thinking, maybe we should conserve some of these buildings, they're not in bad shape, and give people an idea of what it was like to live here back then. And so they brought them up here, and they made a village. And you can come and walk through the village and see the houses and the various things, and this is Degna's Deli. Mrs. Degna, back in the 1850s, was a baker, and she baked bread, and she sold it out of her house, and that is how Degna's Deli started. There is a Degna's Deli downstairs, and it's much more than selling bread. This is the superintendent's house. Not much, but it served the purpose at the time. And this is the old jail. <laughs> Doesn't look very comfortable, does it? <laughs> So after you go through the Pioneer History Center, if you come out and go down further, you're going to see some porta potties on your right. And once you get to that, if you turn right and go down Glacier Point Road, you're going to pass, go past Badger Pass. And Badger Pass Ski Area is one of two things that are unique about this park. There's a golf course, which is right across the street from the Wawona Hotel. And what's going to happen with that, I don't know. And um, the, there is Badger Pass Family Ski Area. No other park in the country has a ski area or, or a golf course in it. But if you continue on out about 15 or 17 miles, you'll see some pullouts on your left. And if you go there and get out of your car and walk down, there's some porta potties there. If you go there, you'll see a sign that says Sentinel Dome to your right, Taft Point to your left, a mile and a, a mile and a quarter to each one. So you can do either one or you can do them both in five miles. If you go to Sentinel Dome, this is what you'll see. You come around the east side and you can access the top of the dome by going up this way. It's about 200 feet up to the top of the dome. This does not sit on the valley rims. You cannot see down into the valley, but you can see across it. This is Yosemite Falls and this is out over the pop, top of the park. You can get a 360 degree view of the park and in the center of the dome here they have a large round uh, plaque with the mountains on it and the names so you can see what you're looking at. If you want to go to Taft Point, you come back to the starting point and go over to Taft Point. Now up here, there is a railing that you can stand out and look out down into the valley. Um, I would encourage you not to try to take pictures from along here because people have slipped off and fallen to their death. But you can see down into the valley. You can see El Cap over here. Um, that is a rock slide. This is Yosemite Falls. Um, and up here is Yosemite Village. And then you can see all around the valley from up here. So once you get done with that and come down and come out, come back out to the, the main road and take a left on your way down to Glacier Point, the first thing you're going to come across is Washburn Point. And this is what you'll see from Washburn Point. 
This is Nevada Falls, this is Vernal Falls, and Illilouette Falls, Illilouette Falls is over here. And this is the most popular hike in the park. At any given time of day, you will find probably a couple thousand people on this trail. And this trail from the base up to here is only a mile and a half. So if you go on down to Glacier Point, you're going to see this. Now this was the original place where the fire, the original firefall started. And James McCauley had a hotel up here called Mountain House. And he would build a bonfire for his people every night. And as, after it burned down, he would shove the, the embers off the cliff. And it made the firefall for Curry Village. David Curry saw it and said, we got to have that every night. And he and McCauley got together and they agreed that they would do this every night. And they did it for like 90 some years. They pushed the embers off the cliff. Back in 1968, however, the park decided it wasn't such a great idea. There were, they had huge traffic jams down in the park in front of Curry Village. They had people all over the meadows. They were trampling the meadows. They were killing the meadows. They were climbing up in the trees and breaking branches. And up top, they were tearing the, the bark off all the fir trees around to make the bonfire. So the park finally said, we got to stop this. And they ended it in February of 1968. In 1969, the, the Mountain House Hotel burned down and they did not rebuild it. Instead, they built this. This is a gift store. This is a snack stand over here. Um, they have in the past sold hamburgers and hot dogs. Now you can buy cold sandwiches and snacks and drinks and stuff. If you come up the four mile trail from the valley, which is actually five miles long now, uh, you will come out here. And, I, and if you get up here, you need to take a break and get some lunch because the only way down is to hitchhike or hike back down. There is no tram going from up here back down to the valley. You can buy a, a, a ticket on the tour bus that goes up there and hike down, but you can't hike, but you can't take the bus back down. This was built, I'm not sure, it was probably in the 70s sometime. And as you come out here and go around this side and out towards the rim, this is the rim, and this is the viewpoint at the rim. This is Yosemite Falls, this is Yosemite Village, this is Awani, and Curry Village is down here. You can see it from the rim. Now, one thing that's up here that the, that the park rangers won't tell anybody about anymore, they stop telling it, is overhanging rock. And people, that's because people used to go out there and take pictures like this. They decided it was kind of dangerous, so they have put up all kinds of barriers and signs don't climb on the rocks and they don't tell anybody that overhanging rock is there. <laughs> so as you're coming back from the, from the rim, you'll see this, this is a geology hut. And if you go up to the geology hut and look across, you will see half dome. Does anybody see the dog in the dome? I've got one. <laughs> okay, this is the dog. Let me do it with my right hand. It goes up here, this is his head, this is his ear, this is his eye, his nose, his chin, and his front legs. He is sitting in the dome looking that way. And there's a legend behind this dog. The legend is that there was a, a goddess called Tisiak who so loved her valley so much that she would take human form, take her dog, and go down and wander through the valley. And early one spring, the Indian chief saw her and fell madly in love with her and spent the spring and summer and fall courting and wooing her and ignoring his duties to his tribe. The fall came, they had no crops, and they were starving. The gods got so mad at her for distracting him that they turned her into rock. She, tried, she cried such bitter tears that they finally took pity on her and put her dog in the rock to keep her company. I'm not sure if that was good for her or bad for the dog, but anyway, it's there with her. There is also an amphitheater up here where you can sit and look out across the park. Uh, there's got a fire ring up there and they give starry night talks up here and you could write to take a tour bus up to it or you can drive up and pay the guy ten dollars to what to listen to the starry night talk and it's a wonderful talk they do it on uh, nights when there's no moon and uh, it's a it's an interesting thing to go to there are there are hikes out of here if you go oops if you go this way you'll go down across the panorama trail over to Nevada Falls if you go back this way you'll go up to uh, Sentinel Dome and this is the view you get from sitting at the, at the observation center. Now that we've come to the end of Glacier Point Road, we're gonna go out here to the east. This, this is 
either Echo Peak or Costco Peak, and this is Unicorn Peak. We're going to go out here to the east entrance. So if you go up to up through uh, Lake Tahoe or come down across Carson Pass and come down 395, you're going to pass Bodie, which is a nice um, ghost town which has docents in it, and you're going to come past Mono Lake. And Mono Lake is an interesting lake because it's got these. These are tufa towers, and they are made by air that's coming up from the bottom of the lake that has calcium in it, and it combines with the carbonate in the water and it forms these tufa towers. It bubbles up and it, as it hits the water, it hardens and, they, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Now the interesting thing is these do not grow above, the, above the, 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 the level of the lake. These got here because in the early 1900s, LA had its eye on where they could get more water. And one of the lakes they saw was this, and they cut off the fresh water supply and pumped it down to LA. Because of that, this lake is now two and a half times saltier than the ocean. If you get a chance to go down there, I would encourage you to go see the Tufa Towers. They're very much worth it. But if, as you're coming out, as you come down past Leviney, you'll see 120 west. And if you go up there, it's 17 miles up. You can go past a mobile station, which has Ronelli Deli in it. And it's a great place to have lunch if you haven't ever eaten there. <laughs> uh, but if you go up, up 17 miles, you will come to the highest entrance to the park. This entrance is at 9,992 feet. Um, when you come through it, you will see Mount Dana to your left, and this is the entrance to Gaylor Lakes to your right. It's up 500 feet and down 200 to Lower Gaylor. And from there, you can go up to the right to Middle Gaylor and then up to the left to a, um, to a gold mine that's up there. They didn't find much gold, so it's been abandoned, but some of the buildings are still there. Now, the interesting thing about these lakes are you may see this. This is a yellow belly marmot. And if you're sitting there having your lunch, it may come over and kind of mosey up to you and try to talk to you because it wants to share your lunch. This is probably a little bit smaller than marmots are, and they like to sun, and sun themselves on the rock. And as you go up to Upper Gaylor, this is above the tree line. So as you go up to Upper Gaylor, you're going to hear some loud chirping, but you won't see anything. And that is because it's these guys. This is a pica, and this is it's eating on a leaf, and it, this is a little bigger than the pikas, and they are very shy, and they hide in the rocks, and they, um, they don't hibernate, but they live in the rocks all winter. They're very sensitive to heat, so who knows what's going to happen when global, running, global warming hits full force some years from now. So as you leave this and go down, you're going to see Tuolumne Lodge, which has some tent cabins there. And the nice thing about this is at the parking lot, at the at the end of the parking lot where you go in, you're going to see this, John Muir Trail. This goes out to Lyle Canyon, which is a beautiful flat hike. Um, it's not uphill at all, and I've been six miles down and it is flat the whole way. So you can go out there, and, and if you want to backpack, you can backpack up to Mount Lyle and Mount McClure, which hold the last two glaciers in Yosemite Park. Mount Lyle uh, Glacier is dead. It is no longer has any forward motion. Mount McClure still has some forward motion, but it is receding faster than it is going forward. So about 10, 15 years ago, I know the park geologist said, in 20 years, the glaciers will be gone. Well, here we are 15 years later, and they're still here because we've had some nice snows, but who knows how long they're going to last. So as you go down a little further, you're going to hit Tuolumne Meadows. This is a beautiful, big, open meadow. Um, I'm on the trail that goes up to um, Parsons Lodge. And, if, and this is Tuolumne Meadows Campground over here. It is closed right now for reconstruction, but at the back of it is a trail that goes up to Elizabeth Lake. It's 1,000 feet up, and it's, it's um, five miles round trip. And it, if you don't mind hiking uphill, it's a lovely hike in a lovely lake that sits at the base of Unicorn Peak. Directly across from the campground is this. This is Lambert Dome. And you can cross the street and hike up this side and go to the top and see out across the park. And it's a lovely view from the park. Now, they have a gas station and grocery store, grocery store and gas station, and a hamburger stand, which was destroyed in the, the, this past winter. So they were in the process of rebuilding that when I was up there. But they do have a ranger station. And you can go in there and talk to the rangers. And they can give you uh, information on hikes 
to suit anybody's need. Hikes that are flat, hikes that are short, hikes that are long, hikes that are um, uphill, whatever you want. And also not far from this is a parking lot with a sign that says Parsons Lodge. And if you go on that, you go out to Parsons Lodge. This was built in 1914 or 15 by the Sierra Club, and it has since been gifted to the park. And now the park staffs it with volunteers every summer, and they have two or three times a week, they have people come in and talk about the park or things, things related to the park. This is the inside. And out this window, just a little ways down, is kind of a hut. And the hut has um, fresh water coming up from underground. However, it has bicarbonate of soda in it, so it doesn't taste very good. I wouldn't recommend that you try it. But it is pure, and you can drink it if you want. Now, the must-see thing up here, if you've only got a little time, you want to do something, is Tenaya Lake. It is so big, I couldn't get it all in one photo for my iPhone. So this has a, a walkway all the way around it. These people are walking their dog on this sidewalk here and you can bring your dog to Yosemite and you can walk it on any paved bike or, or pedestrian path in Yosemite. This is paved so they can walk their park there. They cannot walk it around the back because that is dirt. Uh, they can take it into the picnic areas at either end of the park. Um, and this park is a recreational park. It's a recreational lake so you can swim in it, you can boat in it, uh, kayak or paddleboard or um, row in it. No motors. And this is a must-see thing. So if you go down another mile, you will get to Olmstead Point. This is another must-see. Yes? Can you still camp at Lake Tenaya? Pardon? Can you still camp? Can you camp at Lake Tenaya? I do not, there are no campgrounds at Lake Tenaya. They are down, they are down at Yosemite, um, at Tuolumne Meadows Campground. I'm sure they did. <laughs> they're, they're there, they're at Porcupine, they're at Yosemite Creek, um, they're at Tamarack, they're all along there, but there are none at, at Tanaya. At least not that I've ever seen and not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm pretty sure there's none. So this is Olmstead Point. It's a large pullout on your right as you're going down towards the valley. And you can see half down from here. And in the summer, there's a, a volunteer docent up here with a, micro, uh, a microscope, a telescope focused on this so you can watch the climbers going up, the, up to the top. And you can come down some stairs that are over here to the left, and you can go out on the rock, or you can go out here to the rock and get a better view of Half Dome. Now, as you're coming down, there's another thing to the right. It's May Lake, which is an interesting lake. It's one of the high Sierra camps and you have to drive a mile and a half up to a dirt parking lot, and then you have to hike a mile and a half up to the lake. Now this lake, if you walk down to the lake and follow the path around to the back and go up, you will get to Mount Hoffman. Mount Hoffman is the geological center of the park. If you don't follow it, if you just follow the lake around and go back in by the lake, you're going to see some rocks back there that look like they have glitter in them. That glitter is because that is sand that was brought up from Death Valley. Over the millennia, as the geological shifting of the plates happened, it brought uh, sand from Death Valley up. And if you're interested in the geology of the park, they do run a geology and Tuolumne workshop every summer. It's a weekend long, and it's run by the, the uh, park geologist. It is a magnificent, park, a magnificent presentation. He's a wonderful teacher, and you will learn so much, and you'll probably remember about 5% of everything you learned. <laughs> so so uh, he sometimes does one in the valley, the Yosemite organization has a number of workshops that they do all summer long and all winter long. They run them all year long. So as you come out of that and head down towards the valley, about a half a mile before you hit Big Oak Flat, you're going to see this. This is the second of the giant sequoia groves. If you don't want to spend most of a day driving over an hour up to Mariposa Grove, hiking the eight miles of trails through the grove, and driving over an hour back, you can come here. This is, it's about maybe half a mile around on, on Tioga Road, and it has about 25 mature trees. They're very nice trees. It has a tree, a walk-through tree, that is dead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I dropped my microphone. Um, but it's a wonderful tree, and you can, spend, you can spend maybe half a day up there or less, and you can still see giant sequoias. And when you come out to Crane Flat at the corner where you have to turn right or left, you'll see another gas station there. That is the second of the two gas stations in the park. 
and it, once again, the gas is a dollar to a dollar and a half more than it is in the Valley. They have a small gift and grocery store there, but I would advise you to get gas well outside the park if you want to get it at reasonable prices. So now that we're at the end of Tioga Road, we're going to go to the north entrance. This is, and this is the one that most of us will come in. As we come down from Yosemite, and come down from Placerville, down 49, you'll hit 120, you go into the park. About a mile before you hit the park, you're going to see a sign that says Hetch Hetchy Valley and um, Evergreen Lodge to the left. And if you turn down there, you will hit the, the fourth entrance to the, the third entrance to the park. And that is for Hetch Hetchy Valley. Now, years ago, that is what Hetch Hetchy used to look like. This is Te Uulala Te Falls, this is Wapam Falls, and you've got the beautiful valley that you can go through here. Now San Francisco decided it needed more water and it had its eye on this valley and wanted to dam this valley. And in the 1800s there were some low level fights and court battles that went on. In 1906 the earthquake happened and San Francisco said, we didn't have enough water to put out the fires, we need this, we need this, this reservoir and that reignited all the, the controversy and John Muir and the Sierra Club fought to keep it from happening. However, in 1913, the, the, um, the Raker Act was passed in Congress which gave them permission to build the, the, uh, the dam. This is what it looks like today. This is Teululala and it's dry because it, this was the fall when I took it. This is Wapama and this is the valley. Now they said, we're gonna make this a recreational reservoir. We're gonna build roads all around. We'll have campgrounds, we'll have hiking trails. You can boat and swim and everything in the, in the reservoir. Didn't happen, none of it happened. You can park over on this side and you can walk across the bridge through a tunnel and you can hike this side. Nobody is allowed to put one toe in the water. The only boats that are allowed in the water are the occasional research, research boats that has, that has special permission. So um, it does look kind of like Yosemite Valley, however. So as you come out and come back and save your receipt, because that will give you, get you into the park without having to pay a second park fee. So as you come in through the park, you're going to see a few miles in, you're going to see a sign on the right that says Merced Grove. That's the third of the giant sequoia groves. And it is also a nice park. It's got about 25 giant sequoias. Uh, if you want to get away from people, come to this one. Nobody comes here. They're not marked or anything, but it's a nice grove. As you come past Crane Flat and head downhill, this is what you're going to see. This is Big Meadow, and this is Foresta. This is in holdings. In holdings are places where private citizens could come in in the old days, could come in and build houses and live in the park. Once they made it a huge national park, they got to thinking maybe that wasn't such a good idea. They wanted those people out and they tried to get them out. They went to court and they fought it for years, but the inholders won out and they get to keep these cabins up here. Uh, these are uh, winter cab summer cabins and some full-time homes. There are also park holdings down here and you can go down and wander through the meadow and uh, they have a workshop about fire that talks about this meadow. So as you go past this, you're going to go past a, a, a turnout that will give you your first view of Half Dome and El Cap. After you pass through this, you're going to go through a tunnel. And I would caution you to be careful as you go through the tunnel because if it's spring or early summer, the first part of June, you're going to get tons of people as you come out of that first tunnel because that is where Cascade Creek comes down from the high country and it is forming a nice waterfall through there and people think, oh, a waterfall, I got to get a picture. They pull over, they park wherever they can park, even if their car is halfway out in the road. They grab their camera, they run across the street and they never look to see who's coming. So as you go through that tunnel, please be careful that you don't hit anybody or any cars. And as you pass that tunnel and go down, we'll get to the, we'll get to the bottom of the of the trail. Now, I'm going to go into the valley. Does anybody have any questions about the high country? Okay, yes. You didn't mention Parker Pass. Which... I have not gone out to Parker Pass. Okay, which mountain? I don't remember, I was just a girl. I just remember we hiked through Parker Pass and over the mountains. Do you know which two mountains it's connected? Yeah. There are a lot of passes up here. I'm not sure which one Parker is. They have Mono Pass. They have, uh, there was another one on the Vogels, Donner Pass. Uh, they have Bloody Canyon. There's a lot of them off of um, Lyle Canyon and further, further east. 
um, and I'm not sure where all they are. Where where they all are, most of them are backpacking. If you want to go to them, yeah. And I don't backpack. I don't carry my bed on my back. So <laughs> I've done the high Sierra camps, but that's it. Any any other questions? Uh, if not, you can take grab some snacks. But we're going to go down to the valley. And if you come in from the west, from Modesto, you're going to go past Bear Rock, which is my favorite rock. I love this rock. I don't get to go past it enough. And when you come in the, in the entrance, the first thing you're going to have to navigate is Arch Rock, which is this, which I'm sure puckers some people with some big campers as they go through that, but they managed to get it through. And now that we're into the valley, I need to stop here and tell you that last year Yosemite got uh, nominated for the worst review of any park ever. And this is what it said. I need someone to explain to me the hype of this place. This place looks like any place with mountains and trees. Too many people, not enough stores, not enough places to buy food. <laughs> I'm not sure what they were expecting, but I think it was more than the two, two blocks of Yosemite Village. So as you come into the village, as you come up Southside Drive, the first thing you're going to pass is not marked anymore, but it is the littlest waterfall in the park. It is Fern Falls. And they used to have signs up here that said, fresh water, you know, fill your water bottle, but they've taken those down because they've discovered that Giardine can be in the water. So most people pass by it and don't even see it. The next thing you're going to see is this. This is a sign down by Bridal Veil Falls, which, which marks the place where John Muir and Teddy, and Teddy Roosevelt camped and had their long talk about making it one park. Now, when Teddy Roosevelt came, John Muir was scheduled to go to Asia, but Ted, but Teddy Roosevelt wanted to meet with him, so John Muir canceled his trip and came to Yosemite. They went up, they camped in, uh, upper, in the Upper Grove at Mariposa. They came down to Glacier Point, and this was in May. And when they woke up in the morning, it had snowed overnight, and they had five inches of snow on them. And I'm told that, Pre Ted, that President Roosevelt woke up and sat up and said, that's the best camping night I've ever spent anywhere. <laughs> and they took this picture out on overhanging rock with Yosemite Falls behind them. Then they went down to Sentinel, uh, Sentinel Hotel, and the park had arranged for a meet and greet, and they had arranged for a lot of senators and representatives and state level people to give speeches and for President Roosevelt to give a long talk. President, President Roosevelt went, he shook hands with some people, he gave about a 15 minute talk, and then he said, John and I are going camping, you guys stay here and enjoy your dinner. And they took a cook and they went down to Bridal Vale Meadow and they camped where you saw that sign. Now, and that, and three years later, uh, President Roosevelt turned it into a, a national park. Now the nice thing about that sign is if you cross the street and go down into that meadow, you'll see a path. And if you take the path out, you will come to this. And that is about this big around, it's a plate about this big around, and it's up about five and a half feet or six feet on a rock out there. And it, this is thanking Lafayette Bunnell for naming the park. It was dedicated by the uh, California Medical Association back in 1925. And there are things like this around the park if you know they're there and know where to look for them. So as you come past this, if you stay in the right lane, the next thing you're going to see is a turnoff for Wawona and Highway 41. And I would encourage you to go up there because you're gonna see this tunnel. Do not go into the tunnel. There's a big parking lot out here to the right and pull in the parking lot because that is where you're going to see this. This is the iconic view of the valley. You have Bridal Veil Falls, you have Cathedral Rocks, you have Sentinel Brock, you have Sentinel Dome, Half Dome, Clouds Rest, and El Cap. And I would encourage you to stop there and read the uh, informational signs that are along the bottom here and enjoy the view. When you get done, you can go down to the, um, go down to the, the South Side Drive, and before you go onto the drive, you're going to see Bridal Veil Falls. Who has been to Bridal Veil Falls? Who has been to Bridal Veil Falls in the past year? Some of you have, and it's very different, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, when you pull in, you, it, it used to be kind of a smallish parking lot with some stinky pit toilets, and it had a narrow walkway up to the viewing area and a small viewing area. But this is what it's like today. There are flush toilets here. There's lots of parking on both sides of this uh, pit, on both sides of the flush toilets. If you take this walkway up, you'll go up this lovely scenic view up to Bridal Veil Falls. And that's the viewing area. It's a large viewing area where a lot of people can stop and take pictures. And if you don't want to go up there, 
you can go down on Southside Drive and park on either side of the road here and you can read the signs and you can walk back to Bridal Vale Falls from here. Now after you're done with Bridal Vale Falls, if you come down, you're going to see El Cap on your left. They have cut down a lot of trees so you can now see El Cap from the road. And back in the day, they said, this will never be climbed. It's too, it's too tall, it's too difficult, nobody will ever climb it. In 1858, I gotta, I gotta look up the names here. Um, Warren Harding, George Whitmore, and Wayne Mary. They took 45 days over 18 months. They used hundreds of pitons, scads of rope, fixed ropes, and they climbed it to the top. That was the start of the golden age of climbing in Yosemite. It's also the start of the age that put Yosemite on the, on the world map for a place to come and climb. Part of that is because this is 3,600 feet tall. This is one monolith, and the monolith is a mile and a half from east to west. So there's a lot of climbing that can go on down here. Today, it takes the average climber three to five days to climb it. Uh, some years back, some speed climbers came over from, I think, France, anyway, from Europe, and they climbed it in just over two hours. And uh, Alex Honnold of Free Solo fame climbed it a few years back with no ropes, no protection of anything. He did it in just under three hours. So it's, it's a pretty nice climb. And if you, go, if you go out there in April or May or the first part of June, uh, you can look and you can see climbers over here. There's often a climbing ranger down here with a telescope trained on the rock, and you can watch the climbers. If you go out there at dusk, you're going to see all kinds of lights out here because the climbers now camp up here. They hang out porta potties and they camp on their way up to the top. Now the nice thing about this is there are two waterfalls. This is Ribbon Falls. This is the tallest single drop waterfall in the world. It is 1600 feet from where it leaves the valley rim until it touches the bottom, until it touches granite again at the bottom. On the west, on the east side, they you have Horsetail Falls, which is up here. This is a, a reflection off the rock. This is the falls. Now, every fall on the, south, on the north side is an ephemeral fall, which means that it dries up and goes away by the fall or early summer. If you look at the webcams for Yosemite Falls now, you will see that it's dry. There's no water in it at all. This one runs from mid-December to about mid-April. This has become the new fire fall because back in, I don't know, the 70s or 80s, Galen Rowell, took a picture of it and made it famous. And now you have to have a permit to come in and take a picture of it. It's the last two weeks in February and it's at sunset. And at sunset, you get this or this. And this has become so popular that you have, you, you have to have a permit to get into the park on weekends to take a picture of this. There is no, uh, permits given for, for phot photographing on the south side. It all has to be done from north side drive and they will ticket anybody they catch over on the south side mm -hmm. taking pictures. Um, you also can't drive down here unless you have a handicap sticker. So you have to park up at Yosemite Lodge and walk a mile to a mile and a half to the two main viewing areas to take this picture. But it is worth seeing. So as, you, as you're leaving uh, this and coming up further, you're going to see a pullout Parking, par parking place, and this is Swinging Bridge. It used to be a Swinging Bridge. They got tired of having to replace it every year. In the 60s, they got tired of having to replace it every year after floods had washed it out, so they replaced it with a, a, a regular bridge. The nice thing about this, though, is from this end, it's only a quarter of a mile over to Yosemite Lodge, maybe three quarters of a mile if you go up to the food court. The food court at Yosemite Lodge is around an amphitheater, and it has um, uh, Base Camp Eatery, which is a fast food plus place. It has the mountain, the mountain room, which is, serves dinner only. They recommend a reservation. They serve very nice meals. It has the mountain bar, which serves bar food and has a gift and grocery store. And you can buy food over there and then bring it over here and cross the bridge. And over here is a big picking area. Over here, there is a huge uh, swimming area, there are beaches over here and over here where you can swim. So people come and they spend much of the day here. So as you go down, you also from here you get a, a view of Sentinel Rock, which is right across the street from it. And the, the start of Four Mile Trail is just a little bit west of there, about maybe a quarter of a mile west is where the Four Mile Trail starts. And it goes up through and up to Glacier Point. 
the next, and as you go up the South Side Drive, you'll get, get, you'll get views of the river, all, views of Yosemite Falls all the way up the river until you get to the, ch the chapel. This is the second building in the park that is the oldest building that is still in active use. And it is still being used for church services on Sunday and weddings. And if, they, uh, if, if it's not being used, you can go in and you can look around. Uh, there's a parking lot over here and it's a wonderful uh, church. And, but the interesting thing is that on both sides of this is where the old village used to be on the south side and they moved it to the north side. Now, if you go down to um, Yosemite Bridge, which is next bridge down, you can find on rocks between the church and here, some markers that are about this big around. This one says corner big tree room. That's because it's on this rock by this tree. And this was a tree that they built a room around. A hotel built a room around this. Is a, it was a, a guest salon. Um, and as they tore the buildings down, they decided maybe they should mark some others. And some friends and I have gone through this, and we found maybe half a dozen of those markers. On the other side, on the same side as the bridge, if you turn right, you will see this. This is where the pillars for the Sentinel Hotel used to be, right here. And there are, there are three or four or five of them down this sidewalk. And we found a couple of other of those markers in there. If you continue east, you'll go up and you'll see a uh, housekeeping camp on your left, which has a large beach area on its south side. You cannot park at housekeeping camp. You have to walk up from the village. It's only a half a mile. And across the street, you're going to see this. This is the Yosemite, Yosemite Conservancy and whatever. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting. It's the Lacan Memorial. And it is the Yosemite Conservancy and, and so you've made a conservation heritage center. And you can go inside this bunch of, of uh, stuff inside about the park. And in the summer, they have people come three nights a week to give presentations about the park or things related to the park. This is owned and operated by the Sierra Club. And they staff this every summer. Now, the interesting thing about this is in 1919, Jenny Curry came to them and said, would you mind moving your building a half a mile uh, west so that I can inlay, so that I can enlarge Curry Village? And they said yes. They tore this whole building down, moved it a half a mile west, and reconstructed it. So that's quite a that's quite an undertaking for nineteen oh, for nineteen nineteen. So now, when you come past this, you're going to come down. Oh, does anybody remember the name controversy that took place back in twenty fifteen? Okay, the name controversy. Back in 2015, Delaware North lost its contract for, as a concessionaire for the park. And as they were leaving, they said, oh, by the way, we've trademarked a few things around here, and you might want to uh, listen to us because we've trademarked Mawona, uh, Badger Pass, uh, Awani, Curry Village, and Yosemite Lodge. And you cannot use those names and use, unless you pay us $50 million, which caused a huge uproar and caused lawsuits. And those lawsuits went on for four years, and finally they settled in 1919, and Aramark uh, paid them $8 million, and the park paid them $4 million, and they got the names back. And I had to go down and take a picture of Camp Curry when they took the Half Dome Village sign off of it. But Camp Curry started in the, in the, the very end of the 1800s with seven tents that you could rent for $2 a night in a mess hall. And it has grown quite a bit. Now they have 450 tents, and they have 50 hard-sided cabins that you can that you can stay in. This is my favorite thing about Curry Village. Over here is Curry Village, and this is Stoneman Meadow, which is right across from it. If you take this boardwalk out and turn around and go back, you will see Stair Step Falls. On the south side, all the falls run pretty much all year long. This will get very thin, and it will be a trickle, but it will run all year long. Um, and in Prairie Village, they have a pavilion, which is a huge dining area with a place you can buy hot food, coffee, ice cream. They have a bar here where you can buy bar food. They have a deck, a pizza deck. And around the corner, they have a gift and grocery store, a taqueria, and a mountaineering school. So this is, this is uh, another one of the, the, the uh, uh, commercial areas in the park. Now, if you want to go past this, you either have to have a reservation for the campground 
or you have to hike or bike or take the bus. They do not allow cars past this, uh, west past this. No cars are allowed on the circle that goes past Happy Isles in Mirror Lake unless you have a handicap sticker. So if you want to hike down and you go down and get off the bus and hike straight back from the bus, you're going to see a building back there called the Nature Center. And it has some taxidermied animals that uh, represent the animals in the park. It has art activities for kids all day long. And if you come straight out and walk across, there are two islands in the, in the river that you can go out and spend some time out there. This is where we have our sign uh, uh, honoring Stephen Mather. Stephen Mather was the first National Parks director, and every national park has a plaque honoring Stephen Mather. Now, if you want to hike the Mist Trail, you have to come back out to the street, go over the bridge, and you start up that one. No dogs are allowed on this trail. It is three quarters of a mile up to the footbridge where you can see Vernal Falls. It's a moderate hike, and you can see Vernal Falls. There's a water fountain over here and a bathroom. If you want to go beyond this, it becomes a strenuous hike for three quarters of a mile up 600 steps, and this is why it's called the Mist Trail, because there is mist that comes over the trail. Now, if you're there in the early spring, or in the spring or early summer, the first half of July or so, I would advise you to stop in the park and ask about the water coming over the trail because if it's been a heavy snow year, it will be drenching wet. It will be a shower. And people have gotten soaked clear through. Their backpacks have gotten soaked clear through. So if you have electronics, you want to protect your electronics and take a poncho with you. Now, this is what they used to have to climb to get up there. So aren't we glad we have, aren't we glad we have the stairs and the, and the railing now? <laughs> the railing is new. They just put that up last year. So when you get up there, this is Emerald Pool. It's a lovely pool, but no swimming is allowed because it's dangerous. And there are, there are railings up. There are signs up that say, do not go in the pool. And there's some people in the pool. <laughs> And this, on where they're standing, the rocks there all, are all mossy, and the river is coming down, and this is where the waterfall for, for uh, Vernal Falls starts. So if they slip and fall, and invariably, somebody gets washed over the falls every year and dies, unfortunately. Now, if you want to go back to Nevada Falls, you can hike back. I'm not sure how far back it is, maybe half a mile at the most. Um, but this is Nevada Falls. And there used to be a hotel up here called uh, Casa Nevada, and it was run by the Snow family. And Mrs. Snow used to joke and say, we have 11 feet of snow up here all year long. Her husband is a, five, was six feet tall and she was five feet tall and she liked to take a little nip now and then. But that was torn down in the, in the 1800s. And if you want to go up to the top of the falls, you can walk up a whole bunch more steps up past the falls. And when you get up there, you're going to find a pit toilet. Now, once you get up there, you can go out straight out uh, Little Yosemite Valley, and you can go around and go up Half Dome, or you can come to the right and come over here and go over the bridge and, and pick up, pick up uh, Pohono Trail over to Glacier Point or go down John Muir Trail. Now we recommend if you come up the stairs past the, past the uh, bridge that you take the John Muir Trail down because the steps up are all slightly, are all mostly slanted down and they have lots of sand and small pebbles and stuff and water on them. So it's easy to slip and fall. If you come down the, the John Muir Trail, that's a regular trail and it's, an, it's a beautiful trail and it often has wildflowers and stuff on it. If you want to go to, oh, and if you go over there, this is the bridge over uh, Merced River and there are railings around it and there are signs that say danger, stay out of the water. See, danger, waterfall, and there's people in the water. And that is because right to my right is this. This is the waterfall. <laughs> so if you want to go back to Yosemite Valley and go up to Half Dome, this is Half Dome. And I hiked it the, for the first time in 1997. And it was like seals on a beach. We could not get near, we could not get near the edge up here um, because there were so many people up there. In 2010, the park decided there were too many people climbing it. They needed to regulate it. And so they stopped climbing. You have to have a permit to climb Half Dome from the Friday before Memorial Day until mid-October, anytime you want to climb Half Dome, you must get a permit. They have a lottery that runs in March that you can apply for a permit, and you can have up to six people on your permit. If you miss that, uh, when you get to the park, you can see if you can get one. And if you come and you apply, say, on Monday, then you need to apply by one o'clock in the afternoon, you will hear that night, and then you will get to hike it Wednesday. So you need to be in the park at least three days to hike Half Dome. 
If you have a wilderness permit or if you're climbing it, you're free to go. You can get a, a, hike, a permit to go up to Half Dome with your wilderness permit. So this is, this was at nine o'clock in the morning after the permits, were, after the permits started. And there's not that many people on it. Now they said, Josiah Whitney said back in the 1800s that this would never be climbed, it's too steep. And a man named George Anderson set out to prove him wrong. So he hiked in his boots, he hiked, he put hobnails in his boots, he hiked it barefoot, he put pine pitch on his, pine pitch on his feet. He couldn't get very far up at all. So he finally took a drill and he started drilling holes in the rock pounding in a wooden peg, screwing an eye bolt, running a uh, rope through it, and that's how he finally got to the top. Now, this is later, this is after we came down, they have um, railroad ties and the cables that go up. And if you, if you hike it outside of the permit times, the cables will be down, and they will warn you to be cautious because this is all polished granite, it is very slick, you can slip on it and slide and fall down, and somebody was killed this year sliding down this. So after you come down to the bottom, if you go around to Mirror Lake, you'll, you, it's a one-mile path up to the start of Mirror Lake. And, it, and you can take a, a car up there and park in a handicapped spot, handicapped spot at the start of Mirror Lake. And you can take your dog up as far as the, where the pavement ends. Dogs cannot go on off, off to the side on the dirt, but this is what you'll find. Now this was never a lake, it, it, never originally a lake. This started, I'm not sure how many, how many centuries ago, with a rock fall from off of Half Dome that, that dammed up to Naya River, which comes through here, and made a lake behind it. And in the 1800s, they decided they liked that because they could get ice out of it to use for their uh, hotels in the winter. They could have boating parties and swimming parties and dance parties and stuff. And so they dredged it and they kept, they built up the, the dam again. But in the late 1800s, the park said, no, we're going to stop that and we're just going to let nature take it back. It is now a lake turning into a meadow. If you go down there in the early morning, you can see Half Dome in the lake and you can get a beautiful picture of Half Dome. I am not a morning person, so, so I got out there about noon, and I got a picture of Mount Watkins in the lake. And this will dry up, this will also dry up towards the end of summer, and it may be just a marshy meadow, or it may be even dry. But now, right now it has water in it, you can swim in it in the spring. There's a legend about the lake, and the, le the legend is that there was an in a Native American couple that lived up north, and the wife didn't like where she lived. She went to her husband and she said, husband, I don't like living here. Our neighbors are, are bad. They drink, they gamble, they steal, they lie. I don't want to raise our children here. I hear there's a beautiful valley to the south. Let's take our children and go down there and live. He said, fine. He grabbed his walking stick. She grabbed her burden basket and her cradle basket and they took off walking down to, the, down to Yosemite. She walked faster than he did. She got there first and she saw Mirror Lake and she said, ah, oh, water, and she drank. And she drank and drank and drank and drank and she drank up all the water in the lake. Her husband came along and said, wife, what have you done? You drank up all the water, I have nothing to drink. And he started beating her with his walking stick. And she screamed and yelled and threw her burden basket and her cradle basket and started running away. And the gods looked down and said, what is this noise that's going on in our valley? And they looked down and they saw what was happening. He said, stop. They turned her into Half Dome, him into North Dome, his walking stick into Washington Column. Her burden basket became Basket Dome and her cradle basket became the Royal Arches. And that is the legend of, Half and that is the legend of Mirror Lake. So after you leave Mirror Lake and head back towards the valley, Oh, this is also directly under Half Dome, so you get a good view of Half Dome. There's a three-mile trail that goes around the lake, and you can hike that too. So as you leave it and come down to the valley, you're going to see this. This is the Iwani Hotel. In 1925, Stephen Mather, who loved Yosemite, decided he wanted a premier hotel. He wanted something that statesmen could stay here comfortably. And he hired uh, Gilbert, wait, 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 he hired Gilbert Underwood and George McLaughlin, and James McLaughlin, uh, Gilbert Underwood to design it and James McLaughlin to build it. And McLaughlin said, I can have it up in six months for $525,000. <laughs> like most construction pro pro projects, it had a lot of delays and it didn't get done for two years for a cost of one and a quarter million. But 
Stephen Mather got what he wanted. This is virtually fireproof. The only wood on this are these shutters. Everything else is stone or concrete made to look like wood. Even these pillars, even these rafters are concrete made to look like wood. So it is virtually fireproof. You can go in and you can wander around the first floor. It's a beautiful hotel. You can go in and you'll see a bar to your left, a gift shop to your right, a sweet shop. If you go down, you'll see a, on your left a big salon. And at the end of the salon is a sunroom, which has been in the news, um, and um, the mural room and the winter room. And the salon has fireplaces that are so big that people can stand in them. This is a, a gentleman from the conservancy standing in the fireplace. If you come outside, just outside of this is the dining room. And if it's not the height of the dining hour, you can go in there and wander around and take pictures. That's fine. You can also go in here for breakfast and lunch and eat, wearing whatever. However, to go there at, at dinner time, you must dress, which means no jeans, no flip-flops, and uh, no, no t-shirts, which means men have to wear collared shirts, women have to wear skirts or dresses, and you can dine here. It will cost you, but you'll have a dinner you won't forget. So as you come out and go down further towards the village, you're going to come to a large picnic area called Church Bowl Ch Picnic Area. And you can take a picnic and picnic there. The reason it's called Church Bowl is because it has this. If you go up and to the right and look around, you're going to see this pulpit up here. And back before they built the, the church, they used to give sermons here. Now right across from this is a side sidewalk that goes in front of some houses. And if you get to the end of the sidewalk, this is what you'll see. You'll see Half Dome, and you'll see North Dome, and Washington Column, and the Royal Arches. And over here is um, Glacier Point. When people come to us at the village parking lot or at the, the Welcome Center and want to know well, where can they go to see Half Dome, I tell them it's a two minute walk. If they walk down to the corner, cross the street, and go out to where the trees end and the meadows begin and look up, it will be in your face. And they're surprised, but they are pleased when they go to see it. So now, if you come down two blocks, you're going to see the Welcome Center. This just opened last November. It was years in the planning and making, and they finally opened it. In here is, are the rangers. Over here is a small gift shop. There are uh, signs here about the park that tell you about the park, and over here, and over here, there, oops, over here there's um, a, 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 a volunteer information booth with volunteers in it that can give you information about the park. Now around here where this light is, this is a hamburger stand. This is the village store which is the largest gift and grocery store in the park. And this is the start of Yosemite Village. If you come out of here and cross the street, you're going to see Dignan's Deli. And it has in it, in the center of it, it has a large deli where you can get homemade uh, sandwiches and soups. The rest of it is all dining area. Up here is a dining area, which unfortunately they closed in 2020. I don't know if they're going to open it again or not. So if you go past this, you'll go past the post office and tucked in the corner around the post office is the wilderness center. And they have rangers in there who can give you information about the upper part of the park. And you can see displays about the park, the upper part of the park. Directly next to this is, the, is uh, the, uh, the Ansel Adams gift shop. This is owned and operated by a private family, the Ansel Adams family. This is the second thing that's private in the park. And it is a high-end gift shop which has wonderful jewelry and pottery and all kinds of stuff and a nice bookstore and a gallery in it. Next to that is the old Welcome Center. It is now the Exploration Center and Theater. Behind it is the theater which shows a movie about the park about every half hour. Over here to the right is a walkthrough area where you can walk through and it talks about the glacial and geological history of the park. It talks about the first families that were there and it gives, in, in the back is a section on the climbing history of the park. Over here is a small gift and gift shop and bookstore. And right next to it is a museum. And back in 1924, they started the museum fund to build this museum. And that was an independent place, an independent organization that wanted a museum. It was separate from the park, but they, they got it and they built this museum. Over here, uh, this is a long thing, and this is where they have the museum part. Right now it has a bunch of baskets from the Indians, a bunch of things about Indian culture. Over here is a small uh, gift shop. If you go through and out the back, there is a restored Indian village back there. That Indian village is still being used four times a year for ceremonies by the park, by the, by the Indians, by the Native Americans. 
Now, if you come out and you cross the street, you're going to see Yosemite Cemetery. And the nice thing about this is you're going to look over to the right, and you're going to see a plinth over there, a big monument with a plinth. And if you go over and stand next to it and look over to your left, you'll see this. This is Galen Clark's grave. Now, Galen Clark lived 55 years after he moved to the park. So he was in his 90s when he died, and he was superintendent of the park for 22 years. But during that time, he came down, he picked out his grave, and he brought down four baby sequoias and uh, planted one at each corner of his grave. So these are baby sequoias, and if you want to feel a sequoia, I would encourage you to come over here and do it, because you'll find they're hairy, they're soft, and they have some give to the bark, unlike the hard bark of most pine trees. Um, when you come out of this, if you out to the street and look to your left, you're going to see a big meadow across the street. You can enter it from up here at Oak, a place called Oak Lane. You can enter it from down here across from the bus stop at Yosemite Falls. And you can walk through this park. You can take your dog through this park because it is paved all the way through the park. And um, it has, you get a good view of Half Dome up here. You get a good view of Sentinel Rock. You get a good view of the falls. Now, if, once you've gone through the meadow, if you cross back at Yosemite, uh, at the Yosemite Falls bus stop and head up the park from there, you're going to see a rock. It's about this tall, and it has the sign on it. And if you dare to take the, path, the wooden bridge over to the falls view, you will see this. This is, this is a plaque on a rock that marks where John Muir built his house back when he lived there. And it has a wonderful view of the falls from there. And this is dedicated by the California Association of Social Workers back in 1924. And also behind this rock, there's a Galen Clark Memorial Bench. And I know it's a Galen Clark Memorial Bench because on this center armrest, it says it's the Galen Clark Memorial Bench. <laughs> so, so you can go, you can follow that path all the way up to a footbridge at the base of the falls. And if it's early enough, you're going to get mist from the falls. It's going to be 10 to 15 degrees cooler up there. You're going to love it. Kids are going to love it. When you come out this side, down by the street, off to your left, there's a round, a big round uh, thing that talks about the falls. And this is the view you're going to get of the falls. And if you want to go to the top of the falls, you can do that. That is a different trailhead. But if you go up, I warn people that it's a very strenuous hike. And it is an all-day hike. It starts out strenuous, you get a break, then it becomes very strenuous, then it becomes extremely strenuous. And I say extremely strenuous because up here, you get switchbacks about every 30 or 40 feet. It's out on granite, it's totally exposed to the sun, and it gets hot. But if you make it up there, I would encourage you to look to the right to, and go over there and find some stairs that come down because they have built a platform up there where you can look directly down the falls. To get there, you have to come down here almost to the street, and you will see a sign that says Valley Loop Trail. If you take that, walk past Camp 4, past the, the uh, parking lot for Camp 4, just past that, you're going to see a sign in your red that says Upper Yosemite Falls. Now, if you don't want to go all the way to the top, you can go to Columbia Rock. That is something else that is not marked, but it is a railing on a rock outside the forest. And as you're going up, if you go over a hump and start going down, you've gone too far. And if you go up, this is what you're going to see. This is the railing. This is Yosemite. Uh, this is Lost Arrow. This is Yosemite Point. This is Half Dome. This is the Awani, and this is Yosemite Village. It gives you a beautiful view of the east end of the park, um, and it's it's about an hour up because it's a tough it's a tough trail to go up, and it's a thousand feet up. So when you come back down, if you get down and you turn right and go past the rest of Camp Four. You will, you will come to, we're almost at the end of our hike, you're going to come to an area where there's a construction tape and they say do not enter because they're building a new uh, Indian camp there. This is Wahoga. Uh, it is being built by volunteers, mostly Native Americans. This is the ceremonial lodge, which is almost near completion. These are umachas, which are the houses they used to live in, and they're working on a, uh, a sweat lodge. And I don't know when it'll be open, but it's been interesting to watch it grow over the years. From here, you can continue on down for a mile and a mile and a half down to El Cap. And now that we're at the end of the park, I need to give you some websites. If you want to camp in the park, you go to mps.gov Yosemite. Please do not go to a sponsored, park, a sponsored place or anything that is not the government website. I had a gentleman come to me in uh, 21 
and he had bought two tickets for the two hour tram ride around the valley. He had paid $150 for those two tickets. Those two tickets in the park cost $30 or $40 a piece, and they weren't running them that year. So you can get taken if you go to off-site websites. If you want a camp, if you want to get a campground in Yosemite from mid-May to mid-October, you need to make a reservation at here, and you need to make it five months in advance. There are no first come, first serve campgrounds anymore. There are no, walk, no more walk-in campgrounds. Five months in advance for any campground in Yosemite from mid-May to mid-October. Outside of that, the only campground outside the valley that's open is Wawona and the, ones in the, and the ones in the valley. And that is Upper Pines, Lower Pines, and North Pines. Upper Pines is open all year long. If you miss your window, your five-month window, you can keep going back to the website and check and see when something comes open because it might. And you also need to check the website because there are limits on how big campers can be for different websites, for different, uh, for different campgrounds. There are no hookups at any uh, campsite in Yosemite. And um, there are limited hours when you can run your, run your generator to recharge it. So you need to check and see if your camper fits. TravelYosemite.com is what you go to if you want to make a hotel reservation. If you want to stay at uh, at, at the Iwani, at Curry Village, at Yosemite Lodge, at Housekeeping Camp, or any of the upper, upper, upper camp, uh, the upper uh, valley, the, the upper park ones. And for those, you need to make a reservation a year and a day in advance. And I know that sounds a lot, but they go fast. So you need to get on there as soon as possible, a year and a day in advance. And if you miss your window, you can keep going back and checking because people do cancel and you might catch something that comes up. If you want to go outside the park and stay at Yosemite View, at Tenaya View, at Rush Creek, or a campground outside the park, you need a day use permit to get in from mid-May to mid-October. And you get that at recreation.gov. Um, not necessarily every day, but you need to check at yosemite.gov and find out when you need a permit and you can get it at recreation.gov. I think it costs $2 and you can get in for three days. Yosemite.org is our independent fundraising arm and that you go to if you want to make a donation to the park. If you want to take any of the many workshops that the park offers, I talked about the geology one, they have backpacking ones up to see the bighorn sheep in the, in the high country to see the glaciers. Um, they have Photo, photo workshops, um, uh, painting workshops. They have all kinds of workshops all year long down in the valley. And you can get those through Yosemite.org. If you're interested in becoming a volunteer, you can do that. That runs from May through September. You can do it in the valley or you can do it up at Wawona or up at uh, Tuolumne Meadows. Now, when I retired in 2016, I got rather stir crazy because that was the year the, the drought broke and it snowed and rained all winter long. So I went online and I applied at Yosemite.org for their valley information person in the valley. And I got it for the following year. And I have gone back ever since and I, I love it. To do that, you have to give a month of your time. You have to go for a month and you bring your own tent. They give you a tent site, you bring your own tent and you camp for a month. In the valley, we get half off on several, uh, several restaurants in the valley, and we get free showers at Curry Village. You can do laundry, you can pay for it at, at housekeeping camp, or if it's still working, there's a free laundry down in the, in the um, village at our office down there. So, uh, I've come to the end of our story, and if anybody is nice to us here, really nice to us, we may tell you where we keep the bears. <laughs> So, are there any questions? Yes. Do they still do the Bracebridge Lottery? Do they still do the Bracebridge Lottery? Yes, and it's expanded from previous years. I'm not, I think it may be a week long. And yes, you have to go online and get a lottery ticket to attend the Bracebridge Dinner, which if you're not familiar with it, is a Christmas spectacular with people in costumes and they serve a big dinner like they used to do back in the olden days. And that is held at the Iwanu Hotel and I, I think it costs five hundred dollars or more to attend that these days. Yes. Are there quotas for entrance in the summer? Yes. Are there what for entrance? Quotas. Yes, there are quotas. That's why they have the reservation.com. And if you have a reservation for a place in the park, you don't need a reservation. You don't need a park reservation. If you're staying outside the park, you need to get one. I'm not sure what they are. I think there's about six thousand per day. 
If you miss it, if you miss it, you can keep checking back and see if somebody's canceled. Other questions? You have been a wonderful audience and I thank you very much. <laughs>